So yeah, as Marxists, we talk about the Russian Revolution all of the time, and we have to ask this question, why do we do that? Why is it so important? Um, and it obviously starts with the fact that it's the first time in history that workers took power and began to transform society and to change things beyond just taking control of the economy, um, but really beginning to change everyday life um, and change the social relationships that existed between people. And one area where we saw huge changes um, in, U in the USSR was in the lives of women and in the shape of the family. And now today women face an increasing burden and despite the advances that you know we can sort of see in everyday society that have been achieved under capitalism perhaps, um, even in the most developed countries in the world, women exist today in many respects in worse conditions than they, than they did in the USSR in the 1920s. And I'll give lots of examples of this, but just you know thinking about maternity rights in the US compared to then is one great example that shows this. Um, so it's really important that we have a look at what was achieved um, by the revolution, by the workers at this time and crucially understand how it was that they were able to make such fundamental changes to the lives of women and the, and the construction of the family, because this allows us to see what is going to be truly necessary to transform the lives of women today. So to begin with, I want to track back to Tsarist Russia just to paint a picture of what that looked like so we can contrast that with the changes that occurred in the USSR. Um, I mean, as many people will be aware already, the Tsarist regime um, it was an absolutist regime and it used force as well as backward prejudices in society to keep the masses down. For example, it utilised uh, the Black Hundreds, which is a reactionary monarchist ultranationalist group uh, to incite pogroms and violence against uh, basically anyone who had a disagreement with the Tsar or a different point of view. Um, it was a deeply reactionary and oppressive regime and it was very closely linked with the Orthodox Church, which held a material and ideological control over the population. And it was a, essentially a tool of the state to keep people down. It owned 7.5 million acres of land, it had an annual income of over 150 million rubles, and it preached, which it still does today, that a woman's place is in the home and, and has no other role uh, than as a mother and a wife. Um, here we see this concept of like the man as the head of the family, it's very deeply patriarchal attitude, and that really reflected as well the view of the Tsar at the time, you know, the little father um, of the entire Russian Empire. And this, so this, this view permeated right throughout Russian society. And so as a consequence, the position of women was secondary, they were seen as property. Um, and that's even codified in, in Tsarist law. Um, and we kind of see, um, you know, very many examples of, of what is quite a, a very almost medieval perspective of women that exists still, even into the 1800s, where women are subject to men's ideas, their control, uh, their desires, and men literally had, by law, the right to, to beat their wives. And actually, I think, you know, a fact that demonstrates the regression of, of Russian society under capitalism is the fact that um, domestic violence was decriminalized in 2017 in, um, in Russia. Um, so to give an idea of how brutal it was at the time, though, um, this is from a law um, and advice written about wife beating um, so apologies if this is a bit brutal, but I think it's important to hear. So if a wife refuses to obey and pays no attention to what her husband tells her, it is advisable to beat her with a whip according to the measure of her guilt. But if her fault is very serious, the matter is not so simple and her disobedience beyond all bounds, then strip off her shift, seize her hands and give her a sound beating. And I think through this, you can see how casualized and how normalized that kind of violence was, that this was a, a piece of advice written. Um, and the control that was held over women went beyond physical violence as well. So from a domestic ordinance or like a law of the time, it said, um, a woman must consult her husband on all occasions about everything. If she receives an invitation or summons anybody to visit her, it must only be if her husband permits it. But she must talk with her guests of nothing but embroidery and household matters. And so again, you can see the control over women that was exerted by the male members of the household, um, that was even exerted to what you were allowed to discuss and even what you could talk and think about, um, even in like a private setting. Um, now, this oppression of women, it wasn't isolated. It was incredibly widespread, especially in the kind of quite culturally backward countryside where like the church and tradition had a really firm hold. Um, and of course, the majority of the population were peasantry. Um, According to a 1897 report, sorry, only 13.1% of women in the in Tsarist Russia were literate. Um, girls received on average about a year of like what we would class as secondary education. And that was because they then went to work in the fields at the age of, sort of 12 to 14 um, and were unable to attend school at any other time because they were then also beholden to the domestic chores and the cooking and the cleaning for the male members of the household. So they were doing this from an incredibly young age. Um, of course, the effect of this would be to isolate women and young girls. 
from each other, but also from the ability to organise, to discuss, um, and uh, you know, just be active with other women, essentially. Um, and where there were female proletarians, um, those women were paid less for the same type of work, so a lower rate of pay. And also at this time, and this was true of most trade unions in Europe, actually, um, they weren't allowed to join trade unions because there was a perspective that women were less intelligent, um, and that would mean they couldn't understand the workplace issues to the same extent. They were less likely to strike, and they would hold the male movement back. So conditions in women, although that one about the trade unions was more widespread around Europe, quite clearly the rest of these conditions that I've outlined paint this picture of how women in Tsarist Russia had far worse conditions um, than, than women in the rest of Europe. Um, just to contrast that, um, I talked about the literacy rates in, for women in, the, in Tsarist Russia. Uh, by 1800, so way before the 1900 when I was quoting from almost, 40% uh, of women in Britain were literate. And by 1855, 77% were literate. Um, and then as well, I think a good contrast is the life expectancy to give a, an idea of the quality of life for women as well. Um, for women in the UK in 1900, life expectancy was 50 compared to 30 for women in Tsarist Russia. So conditions for women, okay, they, they weren't utopian in, in the UK at this time, but compared to Russia, they were far more advanced in many different ways. Now, the suppression of women within Tsarist Russia was consciously maintained um, by the state and by the regime through the institution of the state itself, but also its interaction with the church um, and the concept of tradition, these, these conscious ways that um, views were, were maintained and perpetuated. Um, but as well as that, there was a material basis for the economic, uh, the material basis for the suppression, which is based in the economic backwardness of Tsarist Russia itself. Now, the development of Russian capitalism didn't really begin until until the 1880s and into the 1890s, following the emancipation of the serfs in um, 1861. And that's incredibly late, um, of course, compared to the rest of Europe. And so what that meant was that the old feudal social relations had existed in, in uh, Tsarist Russia for far longer um, than elsewhere in other countries where capitalism had developed at a faster and earlier rate. Um, and in those countries, the presence of women in the workplace had begun to transform the situation for them and for the whole of society in general. So when we do begin to see the development of capitalism in Russia, um, it really shakes the, the whole of society um, out of this sort of feudal barbarism that had been uh, existing there still. And it brought peasants from the villages into the towns uh, or into the cities to work. And we see the beginnings of you know, capitalist and industrialization. But the level of economic output remained relatively low. And this slow development of capitalism meant a slow development of the working class overall as well. And so out of 150 million population, at the turn of a century, only about four to five million Russian um, were workers, and the rest were peasants. Now, due to its position in relation to the means of production, um, the peasantry cannot play an independent class role, in, and it can't fight independently against capitalism. And so it wasn't until the working class begins to develop um, that a struggle for emancipation for both workers and women can really begin to be seen, and the results of that can be measured. And so it's on account of this late development and the semi-feudal economy prior to uh, the turn of the century that had kept these conditions of women in such a low position in this almost medieval type um, picture that I painted of it. Um, and, and so I think really we do see a very harsh kind of um, picture for, for women, a really harsh question of the women's question. Now, coming from such a backwards position, I think it makes the gains made by the, the Russian Revolution even more remarkable when we see what they are. Um, and so just to paint a kind of general picture of that, to contrast how far society had to come, it, may, it, it is such a huge leap. Um, so as soon as the Bolsheviks came into power, um, they immediately passed a series of laws and they ensured legal equality for men and for women. Um, women were no longer considered objects or of property uh, to the men, and women were given the right to vote immediately as well. Now, to contrast that, in 1917, the only other countries in Europe that had the right to vote were Denmark and Norway. Um, and in England, of course, we know that women uh, uh, over the age of 30 got the right to vote in 1918, but not until 1926 if you were under 30. Um, in the US, women didn't get the right to vote till 1920, Sweden 1921, and then it was even later, like 30 years later for France and Italy as well. Um, 
the Bolsheviks granted free access to abortion in 1920. And again, they were the first country on earth to do this. And this is, I just remember, just years after this picture of Tsarist Russia that I've just painted. Um, and in addition to that, they, they developed not just uh, access to abortion, but the obviously gains that the revolution made that go beyond this that we'll talk about later um, sort of help develop an understanding of like why women choose abortions and helping to eradicate uh, other factors that might um, bring uh, bring that on as a, not necessarily a choice. Um, they established special maternity wards um, and they um, they brought in paid maternity leave which is really significant. They brought in maternity leave before and after birth which is something that Britain didn't introduce until 1975. Uh, they had night work for pregnant women and women who had just given birth completely abolished so that they could stay at home and um, like recover. Um, and by 1926, marriage didn't have to be registered. Divorce was made as easy as possible. And the concept of illegitimate children was abolished as well so that all children could be treated equally. Um, the other conditions as well that were changed really disproportionately positively affected women. Um, so, for example, a decree adopting the eight-hour working day, um, which they brought in just four days after the Soviet government came to power, ensured that women would have time to politically engage where they hadn't in the past. Um, and then, of course, things that are maybe more famous, like the public laundries and the public canteens were brought in as well, which freed women up from domestic chores. Um, so how how is it that the Bolsheviks were able to make such a big change? How is it they were able to get to this point from such a, um, a further back position? Well, with the economic upheaval um, that the beginnings of the development of capitalism brought came this social upheaval as well I was talking about. Um, workers were increasingly brought together in the workplace and in the years um, 1865 to 98, so in the space of 33 years, the number of factories that employed over 100 workers doubled. Um, so this, this quick uh, development begins. And women were brought into the workforce as a consequence of this and taken out of that isolation of the home that I described to begin with. And so this is what, when we really begin to see the beginnings, if not the like total development of change for women at this time. Now, obviously, we know uh, that capitalism brings misery and hardship, particularly for women who are still under this double burden of, of domestic uh, work at home as well. Um, but the fact is that by bringing women into the workforce created this progressive step because it meant that women could begin to be organised. Lenin uh, writes about you know, the impact of the development of capitalism and Russia on women. And he said, by destroying the patriarchal isolation of these categories of the population who formerly never emerged from the narrow circle of domestic family relationships, by drawing them into direct participation in social production, large scale machine industry stimulates their development and increases that independence. In other words, creates conditions of life that are incomparably superior to the patriarchal immobility of pre-capitalist relations. And so it's this involvement in social production that is really key here. And so consequently, from the 1890s, we begin to see uh, some steps forward taken for women. They are beginning to partake in strike action. Um, they gain education uh, to an extent because there are government initiatives set up to educate workers so they can read and write and, uh, you know, be better workers, essentially. Um, and actually, in the, you know, and to illustrate this increased involvement, 16.5% of the uh, delegates elected to the first Soviet in, in the 1905 revolution um, were women. So you can see that wouldn't have happened if there weren't increased involvement from women. Um, now, historical events have an impact as well, and World War One greatly accelerates this process that's going on. Obviously, we know that the, the mobilisation of men um, into the army means that women are drafted into the workforce, into the into industry. And so by the end of the war, women accounted for 40% of the workforce in large industry, and in some places even higher. So in the Moscow region, 60% um, of all textile workers were women. And to raise the consciousness of these women who were beginning to um, move into the workforce in huge numbers, the Bolsheviks began to organise. In 1914, they created um, a journal aimed at working, uh, working women, Robotnitsa, um, and it had people on the editorial board like Krupskaya, who you might be familiar with, and Colin Tai. Um, but more importantly, they had on their representatives, female representatives from every factory who were discussing the articles that were coming in, politically engaging with the editorial board. And I think it really shows the huge amount of courage that women had, because at this time during the war, 
um, it was illegal to organize in this way. The Bolshevik party were illegal and it just shows the amount of courage that they continued to organize and publish regardless of this. Now, what's really key about this publication, Robotnitsa, is that it didn't simply write about women's issues and try to connect with women on issues that are only related to them. And it didn't try to separate out the struggle between male and female workers. It educated women about the political necessity of transforming society along socialist lines with the need to go further than just democratic demands that would bring about legal equality. And the Marxist perspective of this, of course, is that, um, you know, we, we can only bring about equality on uh, by transforming a society into a socialist society by fighting for socialism. And um, but that didn't mean that these demands for greater equality, what we might call bourgeois democratic demands, to have no place in that. Um, and Lenin explains the connection of these two things um, very clearly. So I will I'll quote him. <laughs> He said, only those who are totally incapable of thinking or those who are entirely unfamiliar with Marxism will conclude that a republic is of no use, that freedom of divorce is of no use, that democracy is of no use, that self-determination of nations is of no use. Marxists know that democracy does not abolish class oppression, but only makes the class struggle clearer, broader, more open and sharper. And this is what we want. The more complete freedom of divorce is, the clearer will it be to the woman that the source of her domestic slavery is not the lack of rights, but capitalism. The more democratic the system of government is, the clearer it will be to the workers that the root of the evil is not the lack of rights, but capitalism. And so this fight for reforms prior to the revolution was absolutely crucial um, and formed part of the way in which the Bolsheviks fought to unite um, female and male workers against the single enemy of capitalism itself. So agitation amongst women was, was really key for winning them to the revolution itself. Um, but of course, despite the fact that the, uh, there was increased struggle at this time, um, and despite the fact that we see the emergence of capitalism and it beginning to transform relations, um, conditions for women didn't improve. Um, in the same way that it didn't for workers in general, of course. And that's because capitalism cannot emancipate women because it cannot, it cannot change the material conditions that engender that oppression to begin with. In fact, capitalism perpetuates um, oppression against women. So why was it then that the USSR was able to make these changes? Well, it was because it seized hold of the means of production and it transformed the economic base of society so that conditions for women as well as social relationships um, and the oppression that they'd faced could begin to be able to be changed. It formed this base. Um, actually, if we look at those demands that I listed out or those things that the Bolsheviks actually changed very quickly to begin with, the majority of the things that they changed initially were bringing in things that we consider these bourgeois democratic demands, ideas around legal equality, like you know, divorce, right to divorce, these kinds of things. Um, and um, th that's, um, but even for them to be able to do that, it required them to change the material base. Like those things could not be delivered on any other basis. Um, and the workers transferred the means of production from private to social hands. And this is um, the kind of key aspect. They took steps towards transferring property from private hands to social hands. Now, the origins of women's oppression comes hand in hand with private property. And so it's only through the abolition of private property itself that we can begin to see the eradication of that private of that um, oppression as well. And I don't have time to unfortunately go into the details of this, but um, you know, Ravi mentioned uh, Engels's text Origins, and we can perhaps talk about it a bit more in the, in the discussion as well about where this uh, comes from. But this was an absolutely essential first step um, so the nationalization of the economy utilized a wealth that had previously been in private hands. Um, and it used that to facilitate uh, turning private, what had been private labor in the home, like domestic labor, into something that was carried out socially. Um, it made it public. It made things like social childcare, feeding and cleaning in the home, a collective task. And by doing this, it freed up the time of women to engage more politically um, and, and removed them away from the home as well. So instead of returning from work and making the tea, making the lunches, sorting out kids' clothes for the next day, cleaning the house and all of those other tasks that actually the majority of women are still doing today, um, women would be more freed up to engage and to do things for themselves, reading, talking, educating, organising. Now, the 1919 political programme of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union had this as its stated aim, which I think is really important. It said... Not satisfied with the formal equality of women, the party strives to free women from the material burden of obsolete domestic economy by replacing this with the house communes, public dining halls, central laundries, crushes, etc. So this was a central um, demand and it wasn't something secondary uh, to the aims of the, of the uh, Communist Party at this time. 
But none of that was possible. It was only possible if the means of production are nationalised and placed under the democratic control of the workers. And of course, this is the key difference between a capitalist and a socialist economy. And this can only be done on the basis of uh, socialised production and distribution, which is done on the basis of the abolition of the profit motive. So the planned economy began to bring women out of the home um, and it began to bring them out of isolation, um, where, where, as I've said, people could discuss. But what it was doing is allowing people to become independent, conscious workers themselves in a society um, that they could be active within freeing them up um, to an extent that I think very, we can definitely argue, had never really been experienced before. And often we see women, thank you, uh, not participating in politics to the same extent of men because of this additional burden. Um, and the, the additional responsibilities. So the revolution sought to change this by reducing that. And it was only able to do that because um, it had taken those resources that had been private and made them public. Um, but it wasn't, I think what's important when we, when we look at this is to also talk about the role that women played actively in a bit more detail. So not just thinking like, oh, well, they were having discussions, but they concretely shaped the future of the USSR as well. Now, everybody knows the role that women played in the insurrection, in the February insurrection, that they were involved in uh, taking strike action and protesting on the day of the February revolution in 1917, that they led, um, you know, workers into the streets and they were joined by male workers workers and that they um, petitioned for bread because the conditions were so horrendous and that they won round the army who had been sent to send their rifles onto the women and instead of them shooting the women they shot they well they pointed them towards the regime they didn't shoot the regime they pointed them at them um, and this is really well known but uh, there's so much more to women's involvement in the revolution itself and in the shaping of society afterwards as well that's really important some of the ways um, in which they shaped this was that uh, they ran and were elected to positions in the soviet they played leading political roles in these organisations and bodies. And actually, Alexander Kollontai uh, was elected um, to the People's Commissar of Social Welfare in the first Bolshevik government, which made her the first um, female minister in the entire world. Beyond that position, though, women were organised, um, were, were involved in organising an armed defence of the revolution. Um, they fought arm, arm in arm and side by side with the Red Guard. Uh, they took in part in revolutionary work at a local and national level as well. You know, just carrying out daily tasks uh, that you wouldn't have, that they wouldn't have been able to do prior to this or wouldn't necessarily have been involved in. Things like distributing leaflets, transporting weapons, um, sorting out communications, caring for the wounded, organising all of this kind of stuff as a part of the defence of the revolution. And they played a crucial role in organising women workers through additional special committees as well. And this was really important for outreach and engagement of, of other workers too. Now, the way that they did this was agitation amongst women. But again, it wasn't along the lines of using feminist propaganda or specifically just women's issues to engage women. It was about engaging a section of the working class who were workers who needed to be involved in this revolution just as much as anybody else to be able to make it, you know, fully democratic as possible. Um, and the fact that they were women really was tangential to this. You know, they were Marxists who were going out talking about the need to socially transform society, what that looked like, what democratic workers' control was, um, and involving other women workers as much as possible. Um, and this was this was crucial, not just in the run up to the revolution and not just in the insurrection itself, but actually beyond the revolution itself as well. And so in 1919, the Communist Party transformed these kind of committees as they had been into a concrete body. They created the Zenokdal. Um, and this was kind of the women's department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. And it was led by Colin Tai and Anessa Armand. Um, but it wasn't just about like a, a kind of a party structure. It was about engaging people and women outside of this. And so it was also consisted of, as well as party members of the Bolsheviks, women outside of that too. Um, and their task was to draw unorganized women in the factories and the villages into the party, into an understanding of, of Marxism. And by 1928, this organization had reading groups of 2.8 million women right across the country engaging in socialist ideas and political discussion, um, reading together and educating themselves. Um, so on a kind of 
involvement level, this was a really key part of um, broadening out the revolution, ensuring the maximum participation of every part of society, particularly of a, of a section that had been downtrodden up until this point. Um, but they did more than that. They also were instrumental in arguing for and bringing about um, reforms and changes. So it was actually the Zenit doll that were responsible for the, um, the act that legalised abortion and made it available in state hospitals. Um, and they were doing this because, again, you know, just having a revolution doesn't automatically change the situation. These were concrete questions that affected women that needed to be addressed, um, that were being addressed through uh, this organisation of women. So this, I think, is, is really kind of key to see the extent and the level of the involvement of women. But what was the impact of this generally on them? Well, um, I mean, the, it's quite hard to measure. So I'm going to use a measure here that we're going to take with a pinch of salt. But um, to show the extent of increase participation by women. We can sort of look at voting records. Um, so between 1926 to 34, the women's vote rose in urban areas from 42 to 89%. And in the villages in the more rural areas, it rose from 28 to 80%. Now, obviously, that's not a concrete measure. We can never use statistics to, to kind of just show us the increased participation. But I think that really does give an idea in numerical form of the amount and the extent to which women were engaging in political decisions decisions or thinking about it more than they had been in the past. Um, so these are, again, you know, just to kind of illustrate a little bit further, um, the changes that were brought about that, that showed the extent to which women were involved, but also the types and tasks that they were able to carry out that hadn't been done before. And this real shaping of the future of the policy of the USSR and the shape of society and their engagement in it. But it doesn't mean that everything was perfect. There were also limits uh, to the advancement of the emancipation of women, <laughs> sorry, women within the USSR. The planned economy gave rise to the basis from which to material eman materially emancipate women. Um, but freedom for women isn't just a question of freeing women up from domestic labour. Um, this is just the beginning. Whilst the USSR did make huge steps towards, um, you know, t transforming the material conditions necessary women were still limited in the amount that they were genuinely freed from the home. Um, and many of the steps that were put in place, so the beginnings of things happened, but we're not fully, fully realised. So steps towards socialised childcare and laundries, for example, um, weren't fully achieved. And also, importantly, the attitudes towards women weren't fully transformed either. These things can't be changed completely overnight. And so this question of transforming consciousness remained one of the barriers that existed within uh, the society of the USSR. And, and Trotsky and Lenin recognised this. Um, they recognised that formal equality and legal equality and even material changes being brought in wasn't enough. And um, Trotsky uses a nice metaphor to describe this. He says, a deep going plough is needed to turn up heavy clods of soil. Um, and what he's getting at here is, is obviously that kind of millennial old, deep rooted, um, oppressive views of women and the role that they have in the home it's been perpetuated and still is in our society today, um, you know, by the Tsarist regime and all these other things that came before it can't just be uprooted overnight. It won't automatically change. For this, the conscious engagement of the working class is um, and, and its leadership as well is necessary. Now, a worker state demands the greatest partition of participation of the workers, working class. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Um, and also for, for people to be educated for that to happen. And so the Russian Revolution made it essential that women uh, increased and also men their literacy levels to be able to engage, that they were involved in reading groups and political discussion. Um, but it also meant that education was required to break this traditional view that had existed. Um, and again, this was central to uh, the Communist Party in, in the USSR, they made this concrete in the 1921 um, Third Congress of the Comintern when they said the aim was to fight the prejudices against women held by the mass of the male proletariat and increase the awareness of working men and women that they have common interests. It was also to conduct a well-planned struggle against the power of tradition, so actively engaging ideologically against this. Uh, against bourgeois customs and religious ideas, clearing the way for healthier and more harmonious relations between the sexes, guaranteeing the physical and moral vitality of working people. Now, whilst this was begun, and women materially um, did engage in social production and, and their political engagement increased, um, again, there were limits to this. And um, uh, it's quite a lengthy quote from Lenin, but I think it is really helpful to understand kind of um, 
you know, just what, what they were fighting against, really. So, uh, and, and again, you may recognize some of this in today's society, but it says, very few husbands, not even the proletarians, think of how much they could lighten the burdens and worries of their wives or relieve them entirely if they lent a hand in this women's work. That would go against the privilege and dignity of the husband. He demands that he have rest and comfort. The domestic life of the woman is a daily sacrifice of self to a thousand insignificant trifles. The ancient rights of a husband, her lord and master survive unnoticed. Objectively, his slave takes her revenge, also in concealed form. Her backwardness and her lack of understanding for her husband's revolutionary ideals act as a drag on his fighting spirit, on his determination to fight. They are like tiny worms, gnawing un and undermining perceptively, slowly but surely. Our communist work among the masses of women and our political work in general involves considerable educational work amongst the men. We must root out the old slave owner's point of view, both in the party and among the masses. Um, and this is important because I think these these worms that he talks about will come back in a minute. But um, yeah, like the, the progress of this changing in perspectives and mindsets was halted um, in its steps. But it wasn't halted by lack of will. It was halted by, uh, thank you, um, by the material conditions, by the, the, the problems with the economy that were faced. Um, and so the second kind of limitation, I guess, that, that was placed on the, the complete emancipation of women was the transformation of daily life and the extent to which that could really be achieved by the development of the productive forces being held back by that previous backwardness that I described at the start. Now, as we know, uh, with the USSR, the old ruling class with the support of the international bourgeoisie um, launched a counter-revolution and civil war against the workers. Um, and this really occupied lots of the resources, um, but also the thought of the uh, people of the USSR, and it limited the advancements elsewhere. Uh, so much energy and organization was going into the defense of the revolution that it was you couldn't spend the amount of time and energy that would be wished to on other questions as well. So the economy was heavily damaged by the, you know, the need to defend against this, but also limited by compromises that had been made earlier, like the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, um, as well as it having started this far further the back position. And so that, that meant that the means of production in Russia uh, were far from developed enough to actually be able to provide enough for everybody at this time, let alone you know, go beyond that and provide these things that we're talking about, like greater nursery spaces and communal kitchens and things. Um, so economic development limited what could be put in place and what could be changed. The Bolsheviks had absolutely the correct idea in addressing this question of education against prejudice against women. And they, I think you can see from their stated aims and from their actions that they actively fought to change mindsets. Um, but the conditions that gave rise to those views to begin with could not be changed without the material changes necessary. And so they were limited by, by that material factor. Um, and the third barrier that came uh, kind of a co as a consequence of that was also uh, the degeneration that came to the USSR, which we're familiar with, um, and, and the um, import of the ideas of Stalinism that developed. So the limitations, obviously, of the economy crystallized um, le or led to the crystallization of this bureaucracy under the leadership of Stalin that rose above uh, society and essentially, in many ways, liquidated the power of the working class. Um, and this political counter-revolution that ensued was clearly expressed through the status of women and the change and the, again, a degeneration in the conditions that existed for women. Um, now, at this time, as I said, there were, there, were, there were the beginnings of change happening and there were tremendous changes, as I've talked about, like really remarkable things had, had been changed. Um, but women were still confined to the home by many domestic tasks and worse, under the counter-revolution of Stalin, they reintroduced some of the old bourgeois attitudes towards women. Um, for example, like re-establishing re this maternal role, um, but also things like making abortions real legal in 1936. Um, they made divorce much more expensive and much more difficult to access. Um, prizes were introduced for families with many children. Childcare hours were cut as well to coincide with the working day. So it meant that like immediately after work, women were tied back to the domestic labor of the home again. Um, and girls and boys were educated separately. So girls could learn like girls subjects that would get them ready for the home and being good housewives. And um, you know, this, these kind of things that all add up to this overall view of, of women again as the homemakers and not involved in, uh, fully in the same way as men and definitely not as equal. And under these conditions, people reverted to their old ways and their old ideas that had been pushed by the Stalinist regime's adaptation to, to chauvinism. So the USSR's success and therefore the successful um, emancipation of women 
had been at this point, as was, as was like the success of the USSR generally related to and dependent on the success of the global revolution. And of course, we know that that didn't happen and didn't come about. Um, so um, it's important to kind of, despite, you know, despite these limitations, it's still important to state that even after the USSR became degenerated and we can see like some of the gains that were clawed back, um, it was still able to make huge advancements for women. And I think that really can't be understated because it gets at the heart of what is key to transforming society here. And, and that is the, um, you know, the, the, the economy and the way in which it's controlled. Um, so, for example, even under the degenerated system, uh, women still received full maternity pay um, and they um, received this for like 56 days at a side. And I said I wanted to contrast this to the US because today the US is arguably and probably accountably like the most developed capitalist state in the entire world. Um, and yet the US has the worst record on maternity rights. There is absolutely no obligation for an employer to give paid maternity leave um, in the US at all. Whereas in the in the USSR um, in the 1930s, they had 56 days mandatory paid leave. Um, a second example of the great advancements of the USSR compared to other states, as well as that the first, um, yeah, the first five year plan meant that between 1927 and 1932, the number of nurseries rose from 2000 to just under 20,000. Um, and they had 12 million kids in nursery. And this is very topical. This is something that's been in the news a lot in the UK recently because the cost of sending a child to one of these nurseries about, was about one tenth of the wage of a worker. Whereas today in Britain, a report was released earlier this year that showed that nearly one in five parents with children under five are spending between a third and a fifth of their salary on childcare. And 15% of parents in England are spending over a half of their salary on childcare. So you can see the contrast in life for parents and what that means today in a modern capitalist state compared to the USSR since such a long time ago. Um, so even though there were limitations, there was also huge achievements. So we have to ask this question then, why is it that it took a socialist revolution to deliver things like that, but also basic legal equality that we don't even have in many states today? When developed countries with huge economies um, that are capitalist are still unable to deliver that. Um, well, of course, it's because of this question that only the seizure of power by the working class can truly deliver legal democratic reforms. Only the working class can actually deliver equality for women and then go beyond that. And that's what happened in Russia. And that's still what's required today, actually. The reason it took a socialist revolution to deliver bourgeois democratic reforms in Russia was because capitalism was completely incapable of doing so. The bourgeois democratic the truth is that the bourgeois democratic program um, can only be, be delivered by a socialist revolution because capitalism doesn't have the will and nor does it have the means. Now, it doesn't have the will because it isn't in the interest of capitalism to create true equality. Um, so capitalism literally requires uh, domestic tasks to be carried out in the home. And you know, families are these private entities that carry out all of these different tasks independently in the home, feeding and cleaning and all of those other things. Um, now, historically, that task has fallen to women and it does continue to do so today. I think something like 75% of uh, domestic labor globally is still carried out by women. Um, it's higher in different states around the world, of course, as well. Um, but public spending on these domestic tasks, so, you know, putting them into a public domain. It's not in the interest of capitalists. Capitalists don't want and they're not able to spend money on these kind of social projects or um, spending that doesn't return any profit. And I think you only need to look at the NHS and how they, uh, the government are trying to strip any spending on something that is like a state institution as much as possible. And it's just completely unable to maintain that spending as well to sort of give an idea of that. And so consequently, you get what in capitalism amounts to a huge amount of pressure on women to be in the home still. Like this is where this pressure partly is coming from. Um, and capitalists propagate prejudices against women to further prop that up. Um, again, you can look at the way in which abortion has been brought, um, well, in the process in America of being brought back in again, this, this greater control now at a time when we should be seeing greater progress um, to increase this control over women in their bodies. And there was this overhang that you can clearly see in the position of women from thousands of years ago that's actively maintained in a capitalist society. But socialism conversely ends this by wiping out the place where that prejudice stems from. Um, but these ideas, they can't begin to be changed. They cannot be changed on a capitalist basis unless the material conditions are changed. Um, and this is what socialism can deliver that capitalism can't. Now, in addition, 
to not having the will and the, the desire to change things. Capitalism also doesn't have the means to grant legal equality or anything that goes beyond that. Um, and I said this was very clear today because in Britain there is legal equality between men and women and yet we, we know very clearly there is a 20% gender pay gap. Um, women do 13 hours of domestic labour compared to the 6.5 that men do on average a week here. 77% of domestic abuse victims are female while one in four women will be uh, raped or sexually assaulted in their adult lifetime. So capitalism can pass all of these laws that, that claim legal equality, but it can't deliver it. It can't even deliver something basic like safety or basic like um, equality in wages. Um, even with this law against rape, only 1% of them are actually ending, only 1% of um, accusa um, accusations, yeah, like ending conviction. Um, so you can see like complete inability to deliver. Whereas the Soviet Union was able to deliver legal equality because it was able to utilise the resources of the planned economy to start to deliver these changes. Um, it's even Capitalism today is even unable to continue with any reforms that it had made in the past. Even small things that have been made to make the lives of women better are being clawed back, let alone kind of invest in huge sums of money that are required to, to really deliver legal equality or actual equality. And of course, this is the case with all reforms that, about the working class at the minute, that under a uh, crisis, they are clawed back. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen, uh, don't have time to go into the detail of it, but we've seen loads of examples of this over the past year with cuts to women's services around the clock. Um, so additionally, austerity is like, as a consequence of pushing women back into the home as well as making lives unsafer. Um, subsidies for childcare are withdrawn. Women are the people who go back into the home to look after kids. Uh, all of this is, um, yeah, like pointed towards this degrade degradation of the position of women again. Um, and unfortunately, conditions are going to continue to get worse for women. And this is despite the fact that we've seen so many campaigns to change or like, you know, sort of educate society um, about the ills of sexist attitudes, but they're not having a material gain because the condition, the material conditions have not changed. And the truth is that no number of campaigns, no amount of campaigns on any different topic um, will be able to bring about equality within capitalism. As long as there is a material basis to the oppression, it will be perpetuated because in the last analysis, it is material conditions that determine um, the, the way in which we think our society, our social interactions with each other. Um, and so Marx said that when want is generalised, all the crap, all the old crap revives. And I think that's precisely what we're seeing today. Um, you know, capitalism has advanced society's productive capacity to a huge degree, and it should be able to deliver equality. And yet, we see what we're seeing actually is the opposite of that: is the reduction in equality. Um, and and so, you know, for workers in in the delivery of bourgeois demands in a proletarian revolution. Um, Actually, the reason that they can do this is because they're going beyond the delivery of those. Um, to deliver them, the working class can't simply lay hold of the ready-made structures um, and begin to make them work better in a better way. That's completely impossible. In the delivery of uh, bourgeois demands, workers actually abolish class oppression by seizing the means of production and, and bringing them under democratic workers' control, taking this collective product that I talked about earlier of labour, of the working class, um, into their own hands for our own utilisation. So uh, we have our own tasks a proletarian revolution that mean that we go further and we deliver that. Um, Trotsky kind of talks about this in the theory of the permanent revolution, so um, we can read about it more there. But an example of this, like of re this, is the reason why bourgeois demands were cannot be literally be delivered by um, you know like a capitalist society. Um, the USSR. Um, in the USSR, the Bolsheviks um, didn't just make women legally equal, but by actually setting about transforming the economy to establish, you know, something like a shorter working day uh, to end exploitation. Through that process, they freed up women, and through that process, they were able to deliver this equality. Um, in developing the means of production under the democratic collective workers' control of the working class. Through that, they were able to provide nurseries, laundries, and canteens that, in turn, freed up women materially. And capitalism. Whilst it has the means of production in private hands, it, it can't do either of those steps uh, to truly deliver any equality. And this is why, um, you know, so long as the fruit of socialised production is in private hands, it will not be able to make any changes. So it leads us to this question, and sorry, I know I've run over a little bit, of, of what is really needed to emancipate women today? 
Well, <laughs> Lenin called all of the other methods that we might see in society uh, foul lies that the bourgeoisie puts forward. Uh, things that we really can't be swayed an inch by, things that they say are making changes. So these campaigns, all women shortlist, increase women in management in different committees or in STEM subjects, for example. Uh, none of these actually do anything to make any change. And I hope the statistics that I've used have begun to illustrate a little bit of that. Actually, the truth is that in order for women to be able to participate truly and fully in political life, they have to be free from domestic chores to the same extent as men. All domestic habits and responsibilities have to be completely revolutionised and they must become social rather than private. Um, and, and just as was true of the USSR, that requires the success of the revolution, in fact, of the global revolution. Um, and so we must fight for workers and women's rights and conditions internationally right now and forge the strongest, greatest link between workers of all kinds, particularly, of course, in this case, between men and women. Now, the revolution itself is a really powerful lever um, in the emancipation of women, but the complete emancipation of women is, is completely impossible without the construction of a communist society. And that requires the active and educated participation of the working class. Already, we have an incredible division of labor. We produce everything socially, but individuals privately appropriate that wealth. We have the means in society to provide socialised domestic work. In fact, we could automate a huge amount of it, which would free all people up from this kind of work. Um, and it wouldn't take much to do that. We have the capacity to do that now, and yet we don't, because it is impossible on a capitalist basis to do so. Um, as long as we operate on a system based by profit, that is not going to be a reality. And so freeing everyone from domestic labour is the thing that we need to do. And that would allow for this breakdown of relationships that we see today that are uh, described as kind of you know necessary relationships where people stay together because of the, the financial and economic need. Um, if we could change society, it will sweep away that um, and, and allow for relationships to develop on a mutual bond, fundamentally transforming the shape of the family alongside that as well. And Engels describes this as the jump from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom for the family. Um, and this is what is required. Um, this is absolutely what's needed to emancipate women, but also by doing that, the whole of humanity, right? Now, I just want to end on a quote from Trotsky. He said, in the last analysis, the development of the productive forces is needed because it provides the basis for a new human uh, personality. Consciousness without a lord over him on earth, not fearing imaginary lords born of fear in the sky. A human personality which absorbs into itself all of the best of what was created by the thought and creativity of past ages, which in solidarity with all others goes forward, creates new cultural values, constructs new personal and family attitudes, higher and nobler than those with which were born on the basis of class slavery. Um, he said, the development of the productive forces is dear to us as the material presupposition of a higher human personality, not shut up in itself, but cooperative, associative. Um, and so it's, it's a huge thing that we're seeking to change, not just these small reforms, but changing the shape of the whole of human consciousness and the family and the position that everybody has within it. Um, and this is why for Marxists, we understand that we have to fight for reforms now that do make life easier for women, but also that highlight all the more how capitalism can grant all of the rights to women that it likes, but will remain incapable of providing material changes necessary to remove this double burden that is faced by women, um, or to actually remove any of the oppression faced by women. And so ultimately, uh, to solve the problems faced by women today, we must fight to fundamentally change society, and that means fighting for revolution.